Hi everyone! Welcome back to another edition of the Velvet Lounge Life. And today I have a, what I consider a special video because it's one that's been requested quite a few times over the last, I would say, year and a half. Whereas I do a Q&A and kind of put together the questions that people ask the most when it comes to button collecting, especially people who are sort of, I would say, junior collectors and beginner collectors. So um, I'm going to answer all those questions in this one video. And believe me, I get a lot more questions than what I'm going to answer, but time is of the essence, as they say. So without any further ado, we're almost going to just get right into this. Plus, I will have other information in this video that you definitely want to stay tuned for, especially if you want to own some of my buttons. So the first question I get quite a bit is about cult buttons. And just to let you know, I am doing this video in a different way. Um, don't know if I'll ever do it this way again, but just trying something new. So I want to first of all, thank you all for being here. You could watch this video or listen to it. So one of the questions I get quite a lot is about cult buttons. People want to know how to identify them. They want to know if they have a button that is a cult button, as well as how to take care of, clean, and even storage for not just these, but other buttons. But I do get them about cult buttons quite a bit. So, and also people ask me like, what, what were they made out of? Well, let's just start with the basics. Colt created a product, it's a plastic, and it was named Colt Rock. And that's what they made their buttons out of, pretty much. And if you collect these buttons, you'll see that they're pretty much made out of the same materials. There are a couple that do have a variant, and I don't know what that variant is. All I know, and I live here in Connecticut, where Colt Industries is located and has always done business, and is still out there today and there were tales of woe that you could which are not really tales of woe tales of woe for me because I can't do this and for you because you can't do this but apparently way back in the day after Colt stopped making buttons apparently you could go to the factory where they made the buttons and people would apparently just find buttons um, also, I know for many, many decades, even with me growing up, and I did not grow up in that area, but I grew up a few towns away from that area, but I would go into that city for work. Um, several of the cult buildings were left abandoned for decades upon decades upon decades. And it was, I believe, in the 1990s or the very, very, very beginning of the 2000s when finally the buildings were being looked at by trust and even by the um, federal government's um, park commissions as to, you know, what that city could do, which is Hartford, Connecticut, to preserve these buildings and, you know, what they were also allowed to do to the buildings. And of course, people had gone into these buildings, meaning just regular people over the many decades, and they had obviously taken things from the buildings. Um, I know that there is a building that is called the Sawtooth Building, where they actually used to test firearms. And you could actually go in there and pick up spent shells and casings in the lake. So... I can just imagine whoever was lucky enough or the many people were lucky enough to find the butt button building, wherever that was, you know, going in there and saying, hey, this is weird. Why are all these buttons in here? So cult, you know, it's a, a very bizarre, if you ask me, marriage of weaponry versus clothing buttons <laughs> just think about it it's so so but like that juxtaposition is just absolutely 
amazing. So um, one of the questions that I do, so I do get questions about the history of them. So there you go, a little bit of history. The other thing is I get questions about how many holes do cult buttons have? Now I will tell you that in all of my research and in all of my collecting, I've only ever seen a two hole button or a self shank button for cult. So here in this picture, you have examples of self shank buttons and you can see their shank is pretty much always this hourglass shape. And then of course there's various two hole buttons here as well. There's, I mean, I have so many more than this. There's many more than this. So that is what I could find as far as what they did for button holing. I never, I know that there was a few people who said they have buttons with four holes. I would love to see them. I've never seen those. There's a lady, her name is Deb Stibbling, I believe it's pronounced. And she is supposedly the foremost um, authority, if you will, on cult buttons. She probably would say she isn't, but I think she is. So don't many, many others. And she like post or she used to post a long time ago um, pictures of her very, very extensive cult button collection. And what I saw in all of the pictures were self shanks and two holes. So hopefully that um, clarifies that. There are companies out there that after they saw these colorful little buttons were obviously making a dent in the industry, they decided to make buttons as well that were not exactly the same. Some were very novelty. Um, I mean, look at the tulips, that's cult and that's very novelty. Um, but the rest of these, you know, you don't see like little ladybugs or flowers or anything like that. But they do have some that are floral, others besides the tulips. Um, and so some of those do get mixed up when it comes to is this a cult button or is this not a cult button? And some people are like, oh, I think this is a cult button. It has four holes. It probably isn't. And also, you know, there's... I think pretty good reference out there as to what these buttons are or are not. Um, so let's look at the next bit. So another question I get quite often, and look, you can see me in the shadows, is actually ponytail. <laughs> is uh, are, it's about the color of the cult buttons. People want to know like what colors did they come in? Um, you know, did they do multicolor buttons, etc. And the answer to that is yes, cult did make multicolored buttons. So you could have a black button, for example, with maybe a blue background or something. So it depends on the style and design, but yes, they did do multicolors. They also did like this sort of marbled looking button. They're not, the, these are not my favorites, the mar marbled looking ones. Um, trying to sort of mimic, I think, actual stone. They're fine, they're just in design and style, just not my favorite. Um, also, I've been asked, you know, are the colors always bright and or are they very muted? They do have very bright colors usually, but there are some muted colors. For example, this yellow is not, this yellow on the paper is much brighter than the yellow of this. This is a pale yellow button. So yes, there's different shades of color. And for each type of button they made, for example, the tulips here, there are other colors besides the brown and the black tulips. So in any one of these buttons, any button that they made, there were usually multiple different colors of the same exact button that was made. Lastly, in regards to colors for cult buttons, know that cult buttons actually hold up pretty well under being washed 
but not necessarily dried. And we'll get into that later when we talk about damaged buttons, what we can do with them, what we should do with them, etc. But for the most part, Colt buttons were definitely made to be, you know, go through a traditional washing machine and be dried on a low setting. So what that does with any type of button, just like with any type of cloth, is it preserves the item so that it does not become damaged as easily. Another excellent question that I get real, I can't believe how often I get this question, I think it's awesome, is how do you know if a button is glass or plastic? Or maybe even if it's made from Lucite. Usually it's a glass plastic question, but most people put Lucite under plastic because it is a type of plastic. And the, there's a few ways that you can tell. One of them, not so pleasant. One is to take the button and tap it on your tooth. Don't break your tooth, don't chip your tooth. This is not good for dental stuff, but do a light tap. It's sort of like when they test pearls and you scrub it on your tooth, but with a button you can kind of just tap it. Another way is if you have a glass or a marble table or granite, tap it on that as well. And you should be able to tell, you know, just the difference whether you're dealing with glass or plastic because um, glass will have more of a sharp, um, clean tone and plastic will have a more of a dull sound. Another thing is honestly, is the button cold to the touch? So if you pick the button up, hold it in your hand, and it's cold, then most likely, depending on the temperature outside, that is a glass button. If you pick it up and, you know, temperatures make a difference. If it's cold outside, everything's going to be cold. So don't do this on a cold day. But if you hold a plastic button in your hand and just wait like a couple seconds, you'll feel that it instantly starts to warm up pretty quick. Glass will warm up eventually, but plastic will be either just room temperature or it will warm up really fast in your hand if your hands are not cold, obviously. All the weather things have to make sense. Another way, and this is really one of the worst ways, is to take your button and scrape it along some sandpaper and you will see that plastic will come off like immediately. It's, it'll leave that white scratch mark. And glass, eventually, if you rub it enough, it'll do the same thing. But obviously, just doing a quick swipe without any hard pressure at all it should leave nothing behind. Um, but honestly, the best way is, you know, kind of tapping it on something else that's hard, such as your tooth, which is not a great idea, um, but marble, even a stone, etc. You just have to be careful because you can damage the button, let alone if you're tapping it on your tooth. So out of these four buttons, which one do you think is glass and which one do you think is, and I'll move this out of the way is the plastic just by looking at these can you tell which is which i'll give you um a second so is this plastic the um blue flower button dark blue flower button or is this big beauty here which looks like a piece of candy a sweetie as they would call them in the united kingdom is this um, and I guess we'll call this sort of a red, it's like orange, a reddish orange button. Is that glass? Is this, and this is actually a lilac color. It's a very, very light purple. Is this sort of lilac purple button glass? Or this blue button, which also has a floral design, but this one reminds me of a sunflower or a daisy versus that one being more stylized. So which out of these four buttons, or maybe none of them, do you think are glass? Okay, I'm going to tell you right now which ones are glass. This is not glass. This is not glass. 
Is this glass? This is not glass. The only glass button here is this one. So as you can see, just looking at these buttons, especially in photographs for those that like buy things online, it's not a really good representation. You can look at all four of these and they totally look like glass buttons. Something else to do is always look at the back side of the button where the shank would be. And even on the like the two hole button here, I would still flip it over and look at the back because sometimes you could tell by the wear. And also on most plastic buttons, as you could see here, they have like this round like halo on the back of them. You could even see what the smaller one here because they sort of like add a little more plastic in those areas, I think, to sort of um, give the shank more strength. So that's another indication. And the other thing is if these, and these are all vintage older buttons, but if you look at these two, especially this one on the back, you can sort of see that wear that plastic gets like when it's starting to turn like a little bit white from the wear area. So, you know, there are things that you can do and look at that can give you a clue whether your buttons are glass or not, especially if you have them in your hands. I know that a few people have asked me about this particular controversy because they were going to purchase buttons. I would say that 90%, I'll even say 95% of people who are selling buttons know exactly what they have. There are no good deals out there for buttons anymore. So people who are selling them, um, they definitely know whether they have glass or plastic. And obviously if you buy through a reputable site, um, and I will even link a couple down below for you, then you will know that you, you know, are dealing with folks who know that there are repercussions if they're trying to represent something that is not accurate. But like I said, most people that sell on certain sites know exactly what they have. So looking at a picture, you know, like I said here, you're not necessarily going to know what you're getting until it's in your hand. But people who are already holding these things in their hand, like you might be, they can, you know, figure out what they have pretty easily. So some of the other general questions that I get, and you guys can see right here, I have, I have my notes, um, are, it, you know, and I'll kind of go through some of these quickly. Where do I find my buttons in particular? Um, I, what I do is a few things. One thing, which is a, um, I'm just going to say it's a word that I made up for this process is called harvesting. So harvesting to me is, for example, if you go to a rummage sale or a church sale and you notice there's a lot of old clothes and the clothes are marked for 25 cents. And I'm talking like you want to see stuff that senior citizens wore in the, I would say, in the 70s and older, maybe even in the 1980s. In the 1980s, those buttons are starting to come up and rise like cream to the top because they were so stylized. So don't leave those out of your repertoire. But what I do is I would go to like a rummage sale, a church sale, something like that, where I know the prices are going to be incredibly low, almost giveaway. Or if you have a thrift shop around you and they do like a 70, 50% off sale and it's really 70 or 50% off, they did not mark the prices up to mark them down, then that means they just want to get rid of this stuff. So you could go in, look at some of the old clothes. You don't even care what the clothes are. You're looking at coats, you're looking at vests, you're looking at men's suits, etc. Um, and ladies outfits, obviously, to see if you can find buttons that you can harvest from those clothes. And after you, and obviously you have to purchase the clothes, take them home, take the buttons off, and then recycle the material by either seeing if it could still be donated or you might actually have to throw it away because obviously you took the buttons off of it. 
I've done that many, 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 many times over the decades, especially when I was a child and even a young adult teenager person. And that is one of the reasons I have the collection I have today. And back then I was just, you know, harvesting things I liked because like grandmother didn't want this dress anymore. It was too blah, 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 or my mother or whoever. Um, or we would go to like a tag sale or something like that. And I would see something that was like three sizes way too big for, for me, or maybe even was too small, but I liked the buttons. So, you know, for 25, 50 cents, you now have, you know, these amazing buttons. Um, another way is by trading with other people. Um, something that I've looked into doing and I haven't done because honestly, I am afraid of the prices from what I, everyone has said, the prices are very expensive at button shows, but for those that really want to get hardcore to the door with button collecting and you have a budget of pie in the sky, you can go to these button shows and they happen all over the United States and in Canada as well. And, and I believe there are some that are overseas, but I know that in the United States and Canada, there are several all over, like almost every state has a button club. So that's something to look into. But what you will find is, you know, people know 100% obviously exactly what they have and they're going to charge you up for that knowledge and for, you know, these fines. But at those shows, another reason to go to a button show is for education because you will see things that you have never seen before, even if you thought you saw everything. And you will also just gain more knowledge even on some of the buttons that you have just for the sake of description, if nothing else, in history, perhaps. And um, another question, and this is more of a debate that was going back and forth, was, you know, how much of this button history stuff is accurate? Um, who, where did this information come from? It, I, I remember someone, you know, kind of feeling as if like, there's a few people who are the keepers of the button information that made all this stuff up and put it into books and manuals because there are books out there and manuals that you can get. I have a couple here myself, but, you know, obviously it's sort of like whoever discovers an undiscovered star in the, the solar system, they get to name it. And sometimes, yeah, I believe that's something that happened. Like, look, I made up a process for buttons um, to find them, and I had to give it a name, so I gave it the name of harvesting. So what you should do is definitely, you know, like I said, that's why I think button shows are really good sources of information because you can compare the information and, you know, see what falls out and what you agree with. But if you are looking to buy expensive buttons, increase your, you know, button repertoire, then button shows are a great place. Obviously, there are secondhand sales um, in overseas because I know we have a decent overseas following. You guys call them boot sales um, or car boot sales. There's, you know, talking to family, friends, of course, you might get lucky going to a tag sale or a flea market or something like that, finding buttons. But I could tell you what I'm finding out there right now are what we consider to be the craft buttons or the throw throwaway buttons, which is a horrible term. But what we consider a throwaway button or some people will even call them junk buttons. They're just not the buttons that most people who are going to collect want to collect unless there's some sentimentality behind it. Usually they're looking for, you know, for example, the buttons that are here on my laptop. They're looking for stuff like that versus just a plain black or plain white or, you know, another regular suit button shirt button type of thing. You know, they're looking for, you know, I hate to say this, but almost like brands and makers. 
um, material, certain materials, certain colors, and usually at tag sales and flea markets, you're not really going to find that, but you might get lucky. I mean, I had an opportunity at one point to buy two giant totes of buttons, and I was actually talked out of it by a bunch of button collectors. Never listen to other button collectors who are serious, hardcore collectors, because they might be leading you down a rabbit hole when it comes to how to find buttons. For information purposes, those people are awesome. Um, but as far as, you know, encouraging each other to go out and buy like the best, they want the best. So they're not always going to give you like the best information. I'm sorry I had to say that, but it happened to me and it actually happened to two other people that I know that live in different states and we're just sort of button friends, but you know, we've never met. So it's obviously not an uncommon practice. Decide on your own, you know, where you can where you want to look but I can tell you harvesting from old clothes is one of the easiest and most un overlooked practices so let's see so next we're going to talk about repairing broken buttons so right here you can see these um, three buttons are broken simply because their shanks are missing they would have had like pin back shanks uh, can you do anything with these? I mean, no, not really. I mean, you couldn't do anything with these buttons without making them more damaged. However, they still have a purpose. If you are a multimedia artist or a crafter, obviously you could still do things with these. You might actually be able to um, turn these into jewelry pieces, like the, the list goes on and on. But people have asked, is it a good idea to repair buttons or do you just leave them as is? So as with most things, this is a horrible answer, but it's true. It depends. What it depends on are a few factors. One, historical significance. Usually if something is historically significant, you do not change it at all. If you dug it out of a gr the ground and it was broken, cracked, missing a bit or piece, and you know, look for the bit or the piece if it, if you can, it might still be around that area. But the thought is, if you talk to museum curators, is that, for example, in museums, they want things as found. And yes, you will sometimes see dinosaur bones and things like that have been modified so they can put together the entire skeleton. That's a different story. But when they're talking about like little artifacts like this, 99% of the time they do not want them changed. They want, you know, them exactly as they're found. The other factor is value. Is it a valuable piece? If you fix it, does it increase the value or decrease the value? It definitely decreases the historical significance of it because if you were to pass this button, like for example, we'll talk, pretend it's this button. If I were to pass this button on to a museum, for example, not saying that this is museum quality, or if I were to sell this button, if I fixed it, because you could see here, there's like this bit of enameling that seems to have an issue. And I believe a piece of it is missing right here. The rest of it, it I mean, as an overall just button, it looks pretty good, especially for the age. It still has, I believe, and I have to look at it closer, but I think that these might be amethyst that were glued in. The thing is, if you fix it and you're going to resell it, or if you're going to curate it to a museum, you would have to disclose the fact that it has been modified and or repaired. At the end of the day, it is a modification. Obviously, if you were to give it to them as is or sell it as is, 
obviously that would be disclosed. And of course you would point out the issues with it and let the buyer make the, you know, the decision as to what they want to do, but at least you let them know this is what you are going to be getting. So I know horrible answer because it's an, it's like a non answer, but I can definitely say if you have buttons that are just, you know, and everyone thinks everything is so expensive. It's, it's not, it depends. Like if you have a 18 karat gold button, okay. And it looks like this and it has enameling that would be expensive. But if you have a pot metal button or a spelter button and it's been done up like this or tarted up as they would say, that does not mean it's an expensive button just because it looks pretty or fancy. So you have to be realistic about, you know, is this worth me investing the money to have these items fixed or not? And the reason for that is in some cases, if you're lucky, <laughs> you might be able to make the repair. However, obviously, it will never be the quality of what the, the item was previously. The other thing to consider is if the button is truly expensive, there are buttons out there that are worth $5,000, $10,000. I've featured them in some of the videos on my channel right here on YouTube. Um, those buttons, their value was in their historical significance or the metals they were made from and or and I hate to say the materials because there are a set of ivory buttons out there that I'm going to be doing a video on. Um, but at the end of the day, those buttons were also never modified. They were never fixed. They were as found when they had those values put on them. So one thing I would say is if you're like, I could care less, I don't care about the value or whatever, which is totally fine. I'm not in disagreement with that. What you can do, of course, is have an actual jeweler, ha make, you know, um, go visit a jeweler, for example, if you have a beautiful enameled button and it truly is something that you think is worthy, you can go to a jeweler if that button is made of metal, especially if it's ster silver or gold, like sterling silver, gold, copper, platinum, you know, the list goes on. And ask them about, you know, if they know anyone that does enamel work. You can obviously also look for an enameler. Um, now with Google, everything you can look up pretty much at your fingertips and perhaps you'll find someone that specializes in enamel work that can fix um, said button for you. However, make sure you see samples of their work before you allow them to work on your items. And that means you wanna see before and after pictures close up. Now certain buttons, no matter how much you desire them, this is a cult button that you're looking at right here you will not be able to fix. This button is damaged due to the many times that it's gone through, probably I assume the wash cycle. And some people would ask like, is this all this um, bubbling, I guess I'll call it, and cracking that you see? It's not cracked all the way through, but this is actual damage. The back of this button should be completely smooth and shiny. And you can see, and even here, I don't know obviously what happened, but this button is one that's made out of cult rock plastic. Obviously, it can't be repaired. It's one that I obviously would not invest in having repaired or even attempting to repair myself. Um, the other thing that people have asked me is, um, and this was an outstanding question that I got, and I just love my answer to this. And I learned this from dealing in antiques and um, unique and oddity and vintage items over the decades. Is if you have a button that is made out of porcelain um, or pottery, is there a way to repair it? And the answer to that is 
Maybe. I know another sucky answer. And the reason why the answer is maybe is, for example, ancient and antique pottery and porcelains and the like have been repaired over the millennia. And the best repairs are not going to be those where it's just glued back together. That's usually, to me, like the worst repair. The best will actually show off the flaw and will be repaired using staples. Not the staples that you, you, you know, out of your, and I'm going to get mine. Not this type of stapler, <laughs> obviously, but they're repaired with staples that um, potters use to fix like old breaks in things. Now, if you ever find a button and it has a metal staple repair, you have found a treasure. Those are probably some of the rarest buttons that you'll probably ever find because I don't even know if they exist. I want to find one and I don't even know if they exist, but there are small enough staples that could be used to make those repairs. So if you want to see what that looks like, look up um, pottery repairs, antique, ancient, with staples. Like put that into your Google search and you'll get some examples of what that looks like uh, when they, you know, fix pitchers and plates and bowls and things like that. Just imagine that on a minuscule scale for a pottery or a porcelain type button. Um, it would be amazing. So I sort of hit upon this. Obviously, if you have buttons that are made of precious metals, gold, silver, copper, platinum, and the like, then obviously what you could do with those is take them to a jeweler and yes, a jeweler, just like they can resize a ring or they could take a stone and create a, um, you know, a pendant out of it or whatever. They do have the um, ability to make certain repairs to precious metals. The only thing is if your button is highly, highly decorated or if it has lots and lots of embossing and stuff like that, no that you will probably lose some of that precious detail when these people attempt to fix something that's broken, smashed, bent, whatever. So here is a button, and I can't remember what the name of this process is. I just saw it on um, Dickinson's Real Deal, which is a show that is... Um, comes on in the B in the United Kingdom on the BBC, but there is an actual name for this type of button. I have to look it up. Um, where they do this inlay. This is a jet button with this inlay in it, and you can see like the damage is pretty much around the perimeter of this button. But the good thing is the most important part of the button, the middle, and this button you can see I didn't even clean it. Um, is pretty much intact. It's the damage is around here. So this button is not something I would consider a throwaway or a garbage button or, you know, a junk button. Um, I think it's, you know, a really good button to have in my collection. It's in there and you can see I have another one. It's right there. And to fix this, there's nothing you can do. It is made of jet. You could like cheat and try to use milli milliput I think it's called or something like that but it would be very obvious that um it was repaired so I say let some of these you know buttons have character and show that they were actually used what I think is so interesting about this button is I sit there and like I wonder who had this button on their clothing? What piece of clothing was this on? Was this actually on clothing or was it on a glove or maybe even a bag or something? You know, you just sit there and you kind of like know that this button has a history. There's nothing wrong with that. Every single button does not have to be repaired or fixed. And like I said, pride of place in my collection of you know, jet buttons, this one is there. 
So this is an example of self, what I call self repair. So since I get so many questions about fixing buttons and what to do with broken ones, here's a perfect example. This is a button that was missing its center rhinestone and you could tell, I mean, I love the decorative frame around there, the edge, but without the rhinestone in the middle, I mean, are you really going to use it? Probably not. So what I do, it, it did in this case because this is not sterling silver it's you know it's not a, an overly expensive button or anything like that is I decided to take out my favorite jewelry glaze jewelers glue and this glue dries like glass and I decided to repair this button myself so the thing that you do have to do is make sure you clean this portion of the button out completely but carefully anything around the edge you need to remove that as well you could go in with this is this sounds sinful but it's true with a metallic permanent marker that's the same color silver and you can obviously clean up the edge even more and then after you brush it out and make sure every like speck of anything is gone that might impact the glue, you simply pick out a rhinestone that is the correct size and dimensions and you carefully put some glue, a very tiny bit of glue um, in the cavity of the button itself and then gently place your rhinestone directly in the center. Now, if you don't do this correctly, it will dry where the rhinestone will be crooked and then you will not be able to fix it because like I said, this glue dries to the consistency of glass. And you can see this looks as if it always lived like this. This is actually an amethyst. I actually was gifted um, a bunch of ameth cut amethyst um, semi-precious stones. And I was like, wait a minute, I know what I could use these for because I have a, several of these buttons and apparently they did a horrible job, whoever created these initially, by putting in horrible glue that did not keep the rhinestones in. So I ended up chipping out the other rhinestones, which was really easy to do, unfortunately and creating a brand new set of buttons with the, a true amethyst stone in them. And look at that. I think it came out amazingly. Like I said, the, the idea is to use the smallest amount of glue so that you don't have excess glue around the perimeter because you shouldn't have to clean anything off. After you put the glue in there, you do want to sit these in something, even a piece of clay, where they it will be totally flat and let it dry for 24 hours 24 not 22 not 18 but 24 hours and you will be able to use them within 24 hours another very 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 i can't tell you how often i get this question and the questions i got i collected from mostly from Facebook a lot because I'm a, um I am part of many 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 groups so lots and lots thank you guys all of you people and folks that are here from Facebook that join this channel thank you so 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 much without you guys I wouldn't even still make these videos because I'd be like nobody cares but you care and I really appreciate that for my junk journal community folks Thank you guys as well, as well as everybody else that watches this channel. I really appreciate it. And one of the most common questions I get is how do I store my buttons? So one of the number one ways, I store them a couple ways, but number one is I use old Ferrera Rocher, so Ferrera Rocher candy boxes. So I use their the hard plastic ones or what they call the jewel boxes. Um, this is simply made of like acrylic or whatever. It's it's fine. And what I do, this is what I store them in. So you can see all these cute little openings are ready to receive your buttons without any argument whatsoever. 
Then what I do is I put a piece of acid-free tissue paper over the buttons, a piece of bubble wrap, and I use a large bubble bubble wrap <laughs> over it. And the reason I do that is because if you don't, the buttons will start, like if they shake around, moving into each other's little storage spot. And then you just put the lid back on and you are ready to go. The other thing you can do, which I did not do with this one, is I on the other ones I actually have labels that I just wrote on a piece of paper, stick it down here on the side so that you can see what you, and you can see here that I did that with these, so that you can see what buttons you have in them without opening every single one. And as you can see, I have a collection of trays. By, by the way, if you would like to gift me a box of Ferrero Rochers, my Amazon gift list <laughs> link is down below in the description. Um, I could always use these boxes, but yes, secretly, I love the candy. <laughs> I haven't had it in a long time, but I thought, eh, that's my that's my little bit of humor right now. Um, so the other thing you can use, and I will put a link down below for this as well, there are some amazing storage boxes that I started using myself um, because, hello, how many box, you know, Ferrero Rochers can anyone consume? Um, and the deal on these is great. Um, you get several of them for one money and I believe shipping is free as well. So that link will be down below for you guys as well. So you can use that link. And what I love about those containers is the fact that you do have individual little slots, um, and awesome lid that's all unlike the Ferrera um, Rocher containers. The lids are attached, so, you know, they're really easy to use. Everything is right there. And also, you can get them in colors, so if that's a thing that you're into. Another way that I store my buttons, and this is like a newer method um, when I got into junk journaling, is I create junk journals by button subject. So my first button junk journal I created was this one right here. And there's even this light bulb which, with a bunch of different buttons in it. But inside what you will find are pages dedicated to different types of buttons. So celluloid, Bakelite, Lucite, um, glass, Colt, the list goes on and on. Um, you can create pages or even entire books that are just dedicated to that one button subject. So you can have, if you collect 30 different types of buttons, you can create 30 different types of journals where you are actually storing your buttons. And I love doing it that way because many times if I'm on the run, I can grab the book that I or journal that I need and go wherever with it and have everything in it about that particular type of button that I need. So I will link a video um, to this particular video down below so that you guys can see what that looks like and also inside like how I created it. It's doable. You could do it. So another really popular question that I got was, how do I sort my buttons? And from the first, I believe even from my first video that I put out on buttons, I would get this question. And what I do, and this is just my method, it, you know, there, I'm sure there's different ways, is I sort usually by material, condition, is the button dirty or is it clean? Because if it's, you know, dirty, but it's in great condition, I need to clean it. I want to separate it, you know, from the other buttons that are clean. Then I separate by what I'm going to keep for my own collection, what I'm going to use in projects, what I'm going to trade, and what I'm going to give away. So, um, and then after that, of course, things that are, so that's how I sort. So that's my hierarchy of sort. So it's by material, condition, is it clean? Is it dirty? Am I going to keep it for my collection? Am I going to use it for projects? Trade or give it away? All of those are the ways that I go through sorting. The last thing I do is when I have buttons that are broken, 
What I do with the broken buttons are a few things. One, I already talked about using it, you know, them for projects. So whether it's for junk journals, mixed media art that I do or other things, you know, I figure that out. And even if I'm not sure if I'm going to use it, I will still put it in the project pile just in case I want to use it. So that's something I would say is if you're not sure, hold on to it for a couple more weeks and make a decision then versus making one immediately. The other thing is with broken buttons that are made out of shell, I, I've done this with glass buttons as well, you guys, whether that's right or wrong, but things that are made out of any type of shell, any type of jet, any type of wood that's not painted, um, any natural material, what I will do with those is we usually throw them in the woods. <laughs> I know it's a weird thing, but we do. I've even put them at the bottom of my planters um, that I grow flowers in. So it's, you know, they're, at the end of the day, they add calcium to the soil. If it's glass, it'll break down eventually and turn back into sand. Um, so I figure, why not? Um, so that's what I do with like the ones that are broken that are made out of natural materials. And as you heard me say, if they're painted, for example, if I have a wooden button and it has like red paint on it or blue paint or whatever, or a variety of colors, obviously that has chemicals in it. So I'm not throwing that back out into nature. Those I will either use for crafting. And yes, there are many times that the buttons are in such horrific condition or they're not made of natural materials that, of course, you recycle or throw them away. So what else do we have? We're getting to the end. This is so good. This has been so much fun. People have asked where they can find my button videos on YouTube because they said find me on YouTube, which is not nice, YouTube. Not nice. Um, but they, this is, um, if you just type in the Velvet Lounge Life right here, or even it right here in your browser, it'll bring you to a page that looks similar to this and you will see the word playlist. And first of all, make sure you click the subscribe button. So subscribe, that would be awesome. And then when you find the playlist, um, it will bring you to all of the playlists that I have. Now you're seeing some private playlists here as well, like wild edibles. You guys don't care about that. I like collecting mushrooms and onion and things that grow out in the wild. But if you look at the list, the list that you see will be a lot shorter and you will see a um, button collecting, how to identify buttons and values and, the, and such. And this is, you know, like a lot of people, the COVID-20. This is a list that has almost 100 different videos on it. Actually, 92 is the number right now. This will be video number 93 for buttons. So that's how you could find that, as well as, obviously, other things that I have on the channel are located there as well. And also, please make sure you check out the Community tab. It says, literally, it says Community. And if you go there, you will see, I just want to change the appearance of this. I don't know why it doesn't stay on the dark theme. Um, but here you will see other information and, you know, like some fun things like what's your nostalgia, antique, retro, vintage, or oddities, um, as well as other information. And you'll even get information. Look, there I am. But you'll also get information about um, future videos coming up, giveaways. Here's a question that was asked about buttons. What is your favorite? It would be great if you guys could go in and answer that. And some people even conversed back and forth, which is really, really, really nice. Um, and so please remember to check out the playlist as well as the community tab. And of course, leave messages. Thank you guys so much for those of you that take that second to do that. It just makes doing this so much more fun, knowing that you're actually living people out there watching, you know, videos that I put out. So I really appreciate that. So last question and answer is how do I clean my buttons? 
I will attach once again another video down below for you guys so that you could check that out and I do talk about in that video pretty extensively how I clean buttons, the different methods, um, which buttons should never ever ever touch water or be cleaned, etc. So, um, and then this is just a bonus. People do ask me all the time, what are my favorite buttons? My, f this is a favorite button that I would love to have. If any of you guys have this button, please let me know. It is, it was one, I think it was, it was, I'm not going to say made in mass, but I don't think it was a rare button, but it's a button that is out there and I've never touched it with my own hands and I would love to be the caretaker of this particular button with a hopping bunny and you could see the um, greenery in the background in this beautiful sort of purpley yellow skyline and then of course this floral bit with this appears to be a maple leaf to me right there in the center. I just think that would be amazing and I would definitely appreciate owning it. But my favorite buttons are twinklers, mirror backs, morning buttons made of glass jet. Doesn't matter, glass and jet are two different products. Um, kitschy hard plastic buttons, so just fun. You know, like this is a plastic button. I just think it's fun. I love the design on it. So, you know, it really runs the gamut as far as what I like. Um... Waterberry Button Company buttons, colored glass, celluloid, especially the celluloid that's like in different shapes or colors or art deco and design, that kind of thing. Um, figural buttons with animals and flowers mostly. Um, people, not as much, but you know, it depends. But yes, there's a lot of buttons that I like, but thank you guys so much for staying this long and watching this video. If you watched all the way to this point, you are a star. And may you be blessed 1,000 times over. Also, I am going to be giving away some of my buttons this holiday season. So stay tuned for how that will happen. I showed the community page of my YouTube channel for a reason, and that is because that will be the first place where I announce the giveaway. So please, you know, read things, respond to things. That would be great. Subscribe to the channel. Um, please take care of yourselves. Your health is your wealth, and without your health, you have absolutely nothing, and enjoy your day. And of course, if you have more questions, leave them down below.